I'd like to introduce Dr. Jane Major. She has the honor of introducing our next speaker, who will be Dr. Glenn Caddy. Here is Jane Major. Thank you, Joe. Dr. Glenn Ross Caddy is director of the Forensic Behavioral Sciences Institute in Fort Lauderdale. He, the formerly, cl formerly clinical professor of psychology and director of training at Nova Southeastern University. Dr. Caddy is a fellow of the American Academy of Clinical Psychology, a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Examiners, a fellow of the American Academy of Behavioral Medicine, and a fellow of the Academy, American Academy of Custody Evaluators. Ms. Dr. Caddy is also board certified by the American Board of Sexology. He is licensed to practice in both Florida and New South Wales, Australia. Dr. Caddy has written five books, well over 100 scientific articles that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, as well as other work that has been published on the World Wide Web. His works have included research in areas as diverse as addictive behavior, treatment evaluation technology, the treatment of multiple personality disorder, the treatment of torture victims, mind control in religious cults, sexual harassment and abuse, the psychological impact of discrimination in the workplace, the education of psychologists, health risk reduction, trial story analysis, and more. Today, much of Dr. Caddy's practice involves services to attorneys and their clients requiring his forensic and or clinical involvement in their cases. As such, Dr. Caddy has worked on issues as diverse as, in, as, in, as is found in post-conviction death cases, war crimes cases, massive personal injury cases, incompetency to die cases, on cult-based mur mass murder cases, on medical mal malpractice cases, and in child abuse cases, including parental alienation, and much more. Dr. Caddy lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with his wife and their three children. Welcome. What I'm going to be talking about today is um, parental alienation in the extreme. And I'm going to dis discuss um, several cases that represent those um, extreme conditions. What I'm also going to be making an argument about is that in many instances uh, in parental alienation, the more serious the condition, uh, the more seriously uh, we see uh, progressively more profound mental illness in many of the people that I'm going to call um, the inducer the inducer being the person who is creating the alienation. Voltaire, the uh, French philosopher, talked about madness uh, in the following terms. He said, to have erroneous perceptions and to reason correctly from them. In many instances, that's a pretty good statement reflecting the cycle of events that occurs in the mind of a person who will become an alienator. The work that I've done at the extreme end of alienation makes the process look far more the equivalent of shared delusional disorder um, and the equivalent of mind control that you often see uh, in uh, extreme cults. In, uh, in Guyana, 934 people um, were murdered, um, mostly uh, by taking cyanide. These included more than 230 children. Um, and the cause of that event was fundamentally a man by the name of James Jones, Jim Jones. In um, in uh, San Francisco, um, 34 people died in the Heaven's Gate cult when they also took cyanide, wearing black clothing and each lying down to die. They, when I was involved in that case, 
one of the FBI special agents said to me, you know, this is a case of one suicide and 33 murders. He was right. We've got a whole history. I mean, think about it. Heaven's Gate. People were committing suicide, truly believing in a profound religious delusion. That religious delusion was that Halley's Comet was coming, and in the tail of Halley's Comet was a vehicle that was going to take them to heaven. I don't think they got there, at least not through that mechanism. This morning we wake up and find out that a suicide bomber has blasted more than 50 people into non-existence and a building collapses in Pakistan. In order to have that sort of deluded belief system, sometimes people get away with it because it's called religion, but mostly it's just plain crazy. What I'm going to talk about is the relationship between the delusional process and the ability of people to therefore justify alienation. If you talk to um, lawyers, especially in the United States where guns are rampant, um, you'll soon find out that in many respects um, practicing criminal law is far less dangerous than practicing family law. Less likely to get killed. Um, and in fact, I have never been, I've never been charged uh, by the Board of Psychology or investigated by the Board of Psychology on any murder cases that I've ever worked on. But there have been complaints made against my license on approximately half a dozen cases over my 25 years in Florida um, and elsewhere in the United States. And all of those cases involved family law. As I think we can all understand, there isn't too much in the way of upset that's greater than the conflict that occurs between a husband and wife when other people get into the middle of it. And they do get into the middle of it during the legal process. And uh, sometimes the outcomes are quite severe. I'm aware of one lawyer who I, with whom I worked. I must admit he was pretty obnoxious. Uh, but I don't think, I, um, I don't think um, being shot uh, with two bullets up the anus is a particularly reasonable outcome for somebody just because they were rather obnoxious. And if you know anything about um, what that means in terms of mafia killings, it's a very clear statement of what they thought of the gentleman. Um, when we, what I'm going to do is make a point that, that in shared delusional disorder, what we really have here is a condition in which, in the early times it used to be called um, uh, folie deux, and then folie à trois and folie à quatre, and folie de famille. And the French implication of that, going back 200 years, is that we've known that sometimes disorders occur within families where there's, where there's one principle mentally impaired person. And that person is able to shape and model through that behavior to other members of the family. In shared delusional disorder, what you have is one person inducing in the other a similar sort of belief system. Now, it's easy to make the argument that, that people within families often have common, a commonality of beliefs. And especially, an easy example there is religion. But when those beliefs extend into um, areas that we would regard as evidence of real distortion, and the beliefs do not seem to be able to be accommodated through reasonable dialogue, then we start looking at a delusional process. The, um, if I look at the diagnosis of delusion, 
The essential feature of delusional disorder is the presence of one or more non-bizarre delusions that persist for at least a month. A diagnosis of delusional disorder is not given if the individual has ever had symptom presentations that meet the criteria for schizophrenia, auditory or visual hallucinations, if present, are not prominent. Um, the, there are various types of delusions, but there are broader categories, in my view, of misjudgment of perception than what we see in the diagnostic manual. And those come across very consistently when we transform a human being from being a mother or a father to being vile. It, it is one of, the, one of the interesting dilemma, of course, is that often this transformation occurs relatively quickly. And it's typically after a rejection. And that rejection um, and the inability to control the circumstances of that rejection commonly lead impaired people into becoming much more impaired. And the escalation of the system that they then become involved with feeds that dilemma. The problem with the system is that it's a system that, that tends to support power way too much of the time. And often, the inducer is the more powerful person, sometimes financially more powerful, conceptually often more powerful, and pathologically so much more powerful that the tragedy is that they can produce a very desirable effect as far as they are concerned. Um, let me give you an example of a delusional disorder that did not have anything directly to do with parental alienation. I offer this example simply to point out how profound the process of shared delusional disorder can be outside of the scope of parental alienation. And then I'm going to give you an example of a case that involved parental alienation. As you might suspect, these things occur in very vulnerable people and children are very vulnerable. But this case involved a, a tremendous amount of responsibility to the parents of a young 13-year-old. The parents themselves were separated and divorced, um, and the mother had remarried and was the primary caretaker of the child. The mother's husband, um, she, however, had been in a religious cult as a younger woman. And she had her problems, let's just say. Um, she was very non-assertive, in some ways really quite ineffective. Her new husband was wealthy. She was very beautiful, by the way. Her new husband was wealthy and had a son by a former marriage. The son's mother was worth in excess of half a billion dollars. The son was 23 years of age when he met this young woman, Jennifer, who was 13. Unfortunately, he'd been spoiled and pampered and allowed to do pretty much anything he wanted to do. At age 23, he was already an alcoholic. Um, he began a relationship, initially unbeknownst to all, but eventually known to all, with this 13-year-old. He was a profoundly mentally disturbed young man. Knowing that the 13-year-old had been very committed to religion as a result of the influence of her parents, he decided that the way he could keep her forever under his control was to use religion as the vehicle to get her there. And other than the sexual impropriety that occurs when a 23-year-old is involved with a 13-year-old while, while the family keeps it all secret so that he doesn't get into trouble, over the course of the next nine years, 
between her 13th and 22nd birthday. He would ultimately bring her to the process of profound psychotic behavior. What he did was this. He began to tell her that he had accepted her religion. He had no interest in religion, I might add. And in the process of accepting that religion, he became very, very consumed by learning as much as he could about extreme uh, Christianity as she practiced it, or her mother had practiced it, in order to be able to influence her at every chance he got, and he did. Um, it included progressively him telling her that not only did he believe in God, but he believed that God considered him to be exceptional. And the evidence for that was that God had begin, had begun to talk with him. It's not surprising that this young woman, now about 16 and a half years of age, would do pretty much anything that he wanted. She did anything he wanted sexually, and she did pretty much anything that he wanted in any other way. By the way, she wasn't allowed to have friends. She was sent off to a private boarding school. That was the only effort that the parents made to separate these two in any way, but they didn't succeed because he moved very close to the boarding school, and she spent many nights where she snuck out uh, and all weekends with him, and the parents didn't do anything about that. In fact, they authorized it. In fact, they developed a, um, a strategy with the school that said he was her older cousin, and as such, he was taking care of her on the weekends. He succeeded in essentially alienating her from most of the girls at school because she had a lie, and she couldn't share that with anybody without massive repercussions. So after she finished his high school, and by the way, she was extremely bright and did very well, what ended up happening is that um, she moved in with him. She began attending. They moved to Philadelphia because she wanted to attend the University of Pennsylvania. She had an IQ of 140. So being smart doesn't prevent you from being manipulated. Um, and what happened at Penn was that he began to be concerned that she was getting involved, that she, was, she might be looking at other boys or young men. And then he began concerned, became concerned that she was talking about some girls, having girlfriends. That had to stop. He stopped it by convincing her that God was talking to him now and that God would soon start talking to her. She found the prospect of this overwhelmingly delightful. And of course, she believed everything she heard. She came down to Florida to visit her parents with him. By now, she was not only um, removing herself from Penn. Oh, I forgot to tell you. She had a five-month-old baby. The baby was creating a lot of stress in the family. The baby sometimes cried. Her husband didn't like that. By the way, they, they weren't legally married, but she called him her husband. The baby sometimes cried. The baby was being breastfed. The baby was demanding time with mother. Mother was an incredibly fine mother, totally devoted. She was loving and caring. Then she started to have experiences, hypnagogic experiences that were the early precursors to a psychotic break. It included seeing um, lights on the ceiling that moved, that she thought were messages from God. She started interpreting a whole lot of possible cues in her world 
as evidence that God was trying to talk with her. She prayed incessantly. She left college, obviously, and she was now living down in Florida. She began to communicate with God, and she began to hear God's word. And whenever God spoke to her, her boyfriend would endorse the significance of that and speak to her magnificence and how as a result of her magnificence, God was relieving him of the ability to communicate and transferring his gifts to her, all designed to further aggrandize him in the eyes of this progressively brilliant but pathological young woman. Well, one day I get a call from a lawyer, an extremely skilled lawyer in Palm Beach County. He has a client named Jennifer who has been arrested and in jail, facing murder charges. I go and see Jennifer. That was my initial introduction to this young lady. She was profoundly psychotic, having religious delusions, and yet she was incredibly confused. What had happened was this. Chris told her, finding, this, this is the, the boyfriend, finding the um, intrusion of the child unacceptable. Chris told her that God would tell her that she had to test her love for God in relation to the child and that God was going to instruct her to test her love for God by throwing the baby down on the stones and the baby would be born again, as was Lazarus. She, she tested her faith following that instruction from God because she began to hear God tell her that. Initially, she didn't throw the baby down very hard and picked it up and held it. But God kept on increasing his insistence that she throw the baby down. She did. Eight times. The last three on the stones of the port back porch. Extremely hard. Baby died. Jennifer was... I began seeing her in jail. Nine months after I began seeing her, well, four to five months after I began seeing her, the psychosis had lifted completely. And then she was devastated because she had to understand at that point that the perpetrator was not God, but was Crystal. The end result was she was found not guilty by reason of insanity. She was sentenced to uh, Florida State Hospital, where by the time she entered the facility, she was functioning emotionally at about the age of 15. But she was free of other mental illness. She was not psychotic. The politics of the legal system however, led her to spend four years in detention at Florida State Hospital, ultimately being released about two years ago. She has finally been able to obtain employment and believe it or not, working for the Department of Children and Family Services, but under very strict supervision and more in an administrative role. And what does she want to do? She wants ultimately to be a psychologist. My point is, 
people can hurt people incredibly. I'm now going to give you an example. But the more profound the illness in the inducer, the more profound the danger for the victim or the victims. I'm now going to give you an example of a Canadian case, seeing as we're in Canada, um, in which I was involved. The case occurred in um, Vancouver, British Columbia. I would have to say that the courts here work slower than they seem to in the United States. I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm just saying that they work slower. Um, and unfortunately, this was a case where the judge had no comprehension of the argument of parental alienation syndrome. Oh, he heard it, didn't believe it, didn't care, or at least he acted as if he didn't care. This is a case involving a very mentally disturbed man. The man was um, actually a, um, initially a US citizen who made a great deal of money uh, by ill-gotten means in the United States. Um, and as a result thereof, was successful um, in uh, living a life that he wanted. He had, they, there was a private jet. Um, he was worth about $50 million. Um, he donated small quantities of it to charities in order to increase his prestige in the community. But talking with family members of him, of his, uh, later on, years later, it became clear that um, he was the youngest child in the family. His father had died when he was nine years of age. Um, and all of the others had gone on and become moderately successful but emotionally very well put together people. This particular gentleman, his name was Ed, did not. He became possessed by money, possessed by security, and possessed by control. Um, he was living uh, for a time in Florida. He lived at very, in various locations around the United States. Um, he lived in places until his welcome got worn out, until enough people in the community knew what he was up to that he left. Ultimately, he fled to, the, to Canada um, and accomplished the act of marrying a woman 20 years his younger who happened to be a Canadian citizen. He fled to Canada because the Internal Revenue Service was now after him. Um, and a series of, um, he'd violated a, um, um, a series of laws that were meaningful felonies. And the IRS and the FBI now had an interest in Ed. Canada, um, however, um, they didn't know where he was for a while. And he set up shop in Vancouver and started wheeling and dealing. This young woman and he had three children. They stayed together for approximately 10 years. During the course of those 10 years, he was becoming more and more egomaniacal, uh, more and more physically and emotionally abusive to the wife. Progressively, the police started being called. They once arrested him over her objections, uh, once of several times, because they saw blood spattered across, the, um, across one of the walls um, and uh, her bleeding when one of the kids called 911, or whatever the equivalent is in, uh, in Vancouver. He was the sort of person who, um, tried to run everything. He, he invested a significant amount of money in a gold company in Canada, um, and then proceeded to try and take over the corporation. 
by a number of misdeeds. Ultimately, he was kicked out of the corporation and there was an inquiry uh, in Vancouver dealing with um, his business practices. Ultimately, he was not able to, um, uh, there were some articles in the news media and he was not able to function um, from a business standpoint there. But he had all this money, so it didn't really matter. Until one time he hit his wife too far, too hard, and she separated. And he became the um, alienator extraordinaire. He used his money, and he was a very bright man, very pathological, very pathological. Um, interestingly, if you upset enough people for long enough, and even if you upset yourself, it's not unusual that you start having psychological problems. The stress of your own actions can induce them. And he started having problems with depression. Amazing. Anyway, he started over-medicating himself, started taking lots of psychotropic drugs because he had no interest in seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And he had um, general physicians who would prescribe him various antidepressants and other medications. That started about 15 years ago. After the um, arrest that led to his, um, uh, that after, his, after the wife finally left, um, she, was, she took two of the children, the youngest, the two youngest she took. The oldest, who was at the time seven and a half years of age, stayed with him against the mother's wishes, but he'd been working on the youngest for the last year and a half. Ever since the first time uh, there was a police incident and she actually refused to do anything, but he could feel that the separation was imminent. Probably two years before, and certainly in the early stages of that, he started working on the, younger, on the oldest daughter. The oldest daughter um, was being led to believe that mummy didn't love her. She only loved the other two and that she didn't love them very much. That she was a gold digger. She only married him for his money. That it was entirely because of her that he was having to take these medications and that it was entirely her fault that he was explosive and that he'd damaged walls, and that it was entirely her fault that he had screamed at her and hit her. In fact, if she hadn't have been having sex with other men, none of this would have ever happened, is what the 17, is what the seven-year-old was being told. Later on, as the, as the legal case developed, there was evidence that said, that showed that he was paying people to make declarations that the, his young wife had been a prostitute and that he had in fact had her as a prostitute and that's how originally they met. Somehow it didn't seem to dawn on him that that was against the interests of both sides. Didn't, didn't seem to phase him. In any regard, um, what ended up happening on that front is fortunately the person he paid to lie um, actually was somebody who knew the mother and called the mother and told her what was going on. Over the course of the next five years, litigation ensued in which ultimately the the court um, agreed um, to allow the older daughter to stay with the mother, uh, with the father, and the other two children to be with mum. Why? Mum couldn't fight it any longer. And the longer as the child got older, 
she became so much worse that mother didn't understand some of the dynamics in parental alienation and allowed her to stay with him thinking he hates me but maybe he loves her. Over the course of the next four to five years, this gentleman um, continued the battle in one way or another. The children would, go to, would be required to spend time with him. By this stage, he's changed his drug habits. He's now, be, he's now becoming intoxicated with alcohol and he's doing amazingly for a man who was then about 60 years of age, cocaine and heroin. Moving up the scale and of course chronically depressed. The children would come back telling their mother that dad was, there was something wrong with dad. None of the issues about cocaine and heroin were known. I'm sort of fast forwarding and giving you something. Meanwhile, the now 17 year old, who is moderately bright, drops out of school, runs away from home. She's done it about three or four times. Why? Because now he turns on her. He turns on her because she wasn't supportive of him enough. She didn't love him enough. She wanted a life of her own. She runs away from home. Comes and stays with mother for a short period of time, but can't handle the structure and discipline in the mother's house and has no, nowhere else to go. So goes back to dad. Runs away again with boyfriends. She becomes pregnant. She miscarries. She comes back home. Then she starts doing drugs. She starts with marijuana, soon goes to cocaine, hangs out with a large group of druggies, or her whole group of friends are druggies. She alienates herself from anybody else that she previously knew. And then dad asks her to supply him with cocaine. She does. In fact, he starts providing funding for it because he doesn't want her pimping anymore. Fast forward two and a half years. At 65 years of age, he is found dead by her. A profound drug overdose. She has spent, this happened, by the way, this particular event happened about 15 weeks ago. She has been in a, an inpatient mental facility since that time because after finding him dead, she became convinced that he, she had no purpose to life and she attempted to kill herself. Fortunately, she failed. She had exactly the same belief systems about her mother that he had injected within her. The court, as this proceeding went along, the children were being required to visit him, but they lived at a distance. So they only got to see him at certain vacation times. And he would try and clean himself up for some of those. But as things deteriorated, he couldn't. And they started not wanting to go and see him. In fact, there were so many reports now by the Department of Children and Family Services that they called the mother and threatened to charge her with an offence should she allow them to go visit him. So she withheld visitation. The courts had a hearing. Children and Family Services backed down the visitations continued until the children, now 14 and 13, flatly refused to go visit him anymore because last time he was drugged out all the time. <laughs>
These are two cases involving the impact of mind control where the child comes to truly believe the edicts of the person who's injecting those belief systems within her. And she denies, in this case there were two girls, but I've seen it in boys, where they deny other realities. If you like, going back to where I started with the quote from Voltaire, to have erroneous perceptions and to reason correctly from them. The perceptions were so defective that the interpretations that they made all occurred within the framework of that distortion. The hardware may have been working fine, but the software had profound error messages in it. Part of the, part of the problem is that, you know, if the, if the damage becomes too great, um, people do sometimes seriously think about suicide. I think in a strange way, Ed, his drug use of, towards the latter stages and his ultimate death was a combination of two things. An egomaniacal tendency to have to be right all the time, but with it, a contravening recognition that in so many ways he'd screwed up so badly that he couldn't, his ego couldn't handle his own failures. And so he turned to drugs as a way of coping. And so even with all of the unkindnesses that he enacted, in some respects, from a clinical standpoint, one can have a lot of sympathy for that sort of self-destruction. I mean, I don't think for a moment he set out to create the carnage that he created. He didn't understand where he was going. He was operating out of rage and fear and, and um, a conviction that he was going to rule the world. And unfortunately, it destroyed him. In the case of Ed, right from the outset to the oldest girl, you are going to regularly see your mother. I think that that intervention in and of itself would have been incredibly successful in mitigating the possibility of it going the way it did. But in fact, she was operating from such a egocentric framework herself by age seven, modeling her dad, that nobody was going to tell her what to do. And the courts didn't. And, um, and of course, dad succeeded in using that uh, to preserve his own agenda. So courts contribute to this problem in many respects. As we know, as, as I presume most of you know, parental alienation syndrome is not defined as a specific diagnostic category. It's a, it's a phenomenon uh, that we see in the community and we can see, and, and certainly what we can find from it are diagnoses. For example, it would, it's very easy to, to diagnose the consequences, um, but the process um, is, rarely do we diagnose a process. Normally what we d diagnose is the consequences of a process. I mean, for example, um, I'm sure there are people in this room um, who experience depression. I'm sure there are people who experience anxiety. Maybe some people have panic attacks. Maybe some have alcohol problems. Um, we diagnose the outcome of the process that got them there, not the process. Unfortunately, medications don't solve the process of rehabilitation. They simply change the metric a little bit. Um, if you're going to really change software, you don't do it with medication. You do it with psychotherapy. I think that in some instances, the phenomenon of PAS uh, marries um, the direct um, sequence of events that occurs in shared delusional disorder and also the induction through mind control uh, that you see in certain other pathologies. For example, the cults that we've spoken about. There's not all that much difference between cult phenomenon and the induction of PAS because the, the same mechanisms are in play.
Thank you very much.